Next speaker is Professor Joey Shapiro from Vancouver, Canada, and New York, USC. The title of his talk today is Hello, Los in Woman, What Do I Do? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Joey Shapiro. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a practical approach as to how I deal with women who come into our office with hair loss. I divide my time two weeks per month at NYU and two weeks per month um, at UBC seeing patients. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures of um, irrelevant uh, relationships with industry. And I'd like to first to recognize our lab, who helps so, me understand so much about uh, hair biology. It's run by Kevin McElvey, who's in our front row here. And it's uh, because of him and all the people he's recruited in our lab that really has given me a greater understanding of the hair follicle and, and allows me to understand when I, when I treat patients, what more, what, what am I really doing with these pharmaceutical agents? I also want to um, acknowledge our hair transplant group. Hair transplantation is an important part of the treatment of hair loss in women. When I started in 1992 doing hair transplants, we hardly did any women. We only did around um, uh, one in 10 uh, but women, and now we, we're a third are women now. We're doing more and more women. My practice is exclusively hair and scalp disorders. Now I do no longer do uh, general dermatology. At the University of British Columbia, we see 60 to 70 hair loss patients every single day. It truly is a lot of patients, and at least 40 are female patients every single day. And you probably wonder, how do I see that many hair loss patients per day because they take so long? Well, I'm very lucky in that I have a battalion or an army of hair fellows who come to me and spend one to three years with me. Many are here in this audience who, uh, who help me. They're the first line in seeing these patients and, and allow me to see this kind of volume at the University of British Columbia. So we all are used to women coming into our offices, coming with this kind of hair loss, this kind of hair loss, this. And they usually come in with a bag of hair. Or they'll come in with very scarred hair loss as well. How do, you, how do we approach these women? What do we tell these women? A lot of what I'm about to discuss was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. It's an article from quite a while ago. It was the first time the New England Journal of Medicine thought that hair loss in women was relevant enough for that journal. Um, it was always thought to be something frivolous. Um, and it was, uh, it, uh, when they came and invited me to do this article, I just thought, this is great. We'll finally get internists to take this seriously. We'll get medical students to take this seriously. So it was an important, uh, I felt it was an important step, step in that hair loss is finally being embraced by the medical community, not just by dermatologists. So how to approach the hair loss patient? Well, first of all, patients usually come in with a bag of hair, they come in with their vitamins, they come in with their medications, and they say, well, what's going on? Why am I losing all this hair? And you really need to be a detective, a Sherlock Holmes, to figure out the cause of hair loss in some of these women. It can take a very long time. My consultations in New York can take one hour, sometimes an hour and a half to two hours, with some of these women to try to dissect out why they're losing their hair. Uh, in Vancouver, of course, things have to go a little more quickly, uh, but when you, uh, but, in, uh, but it, you have to kind of do this in an organized way. A meticulous history and scalp examination is extremely important. The first thing I ask every woman is the following. Can you complete this sentence? My hair and scalp was perfectly normal up until, and they have to finish that sentence. 
and that will tell me how long they've had it. And that will already help me in the differential diagnosis. The youngest case of male pattern hair loss or female pattern hair loss that I've seen is age eight. I've seen, um, just prepubescent, we have seen it. Next, is it global or is it diffuse? Is it all over the whole scalp or is it in certain areas? Obviously, in case like this, it's localized in certain areas. Next, we ask, is everybody spinning, but is there shedding involved? You need to quantify how much shedding a patient has. We all know their ponytail diameters are half what they used to be. Some even say a quarter what they used to be. But where's all this hair going? You need to ask the patient, where, where do you find this hair? Where is it? And so there are certain key questions to really figure out how much shedding there is. I mean, they come in with this bag of hair. That's fine. You, when they do come in with a bag of hair, you always have to ask, how long did it take to get this bag of hair? If it took one year or two years to get this bag of hair, that's not an excess shedding. If it took just two weeks, that's excess shedding. So whenever you see a bag of hair, you need to time it. You need to know the amount per unit time, not just look at the volume. We had a patient who was so into how much hair she was losing, she diarized it for five years, how much hair. Some women can become totally obsessed with the amount of hair that they lose every day. They count it, they come in now with Excel spreadsheets, we go through the numbers, uh, when they shampooed, when they didn't shampoo, when they went to the hairdresser, and so uh, all of these things, you know, you, you need to kind of qu help quantify, help the patient quantify how much hair is normal, how much isn't, and so there are some key questions. My two key questions are, First of all, can they see? I mean, if they're elderly, they don't have good eyes. But I mean, if you have, so you have to make sure their vision is decent. And then you ask, is there hair on your pillow? Because if there is massive shedding, there's going to be hair on the pillow. Next, you need to find out if they cook. Many women in New York do not cook. Um, it, it is, uh, the, uh, there's a joke that the, um, the stove in, in New York is used as a filing cabinet. It's not used for uh, cooking. And um, so you find out if the patient cooks. And if the female patient cooks, is there hair in the food? And is there hair on the kitchen counter? Is there hair on the stove? Is there hair in the fridge? You need to ask these questions. If there is, then there is massive shedding. And you need to find out whether there truly is massive shedding or not. Keep in mind, you need to lose 50% of your scalp hair to notice any change clinically. So someone who has 100,000 hairs versus someone who has 50,000 hairs, it looks exactly the same. So when they come to your office, they look normal. But that doesn't mean it's normal. They have lost a lot of hair. They wouldn't take a half a day off work to come and see you and uh, to, if they weren't losing significant amounts of hair usually. Next, you need to find out, is the hair falling out from the roots or is it breaking? If it's from the roots, you think of antigenetic hair loss or patterned hair loss, telogen effluvium or alopecia areata. If it's breaking, think of tinea capitis, hair cosmetics, trichotillomania, or hair shaft abnormalities. Other questions to ask is family history. It's really important to get into the family history, not just the mother and father and siblings. Go to the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles. You really have to get into the family history in great detail. And you'll usually find someone who has it. Many say, oh, there's nobody who has it. There's, and then, you know, they think that no woman has it, but there are a lot of men who have it. So you have to go through this history very, very carefully. Next, hair care practices. What are they doing to their hair? How often do they shampoo? There are certain women, the old matriarch women of New York City, only go to the hairdresser once a week. They will not put minoxidil on their scalp twice a day. 
Okay, they just they just let the hairdresser wash their hair once a week. Okay, then then the uh, the black females they only wash their hair every two weeks. Okay, so they're not going to put your, uh, their, your topical monoxidal solution on so easily as well. So you need to find out what they're doing. And if they're using relaxers, if they're using um, various hair cosmetics that can be actually causing their hair to break or causing some problems uh, for them. So it's important to spend time going through hair care practices. Next, systemic illness. If you're not well, you're probably not, you're probably may have a telogen effluvia. So if ask about kidney disease, liver disease, um, um, hematologic disease, what's going on? How is their general health? We are doctors, okay? We need to find out how they, what their health is all about. That takes time. You have to do a good functional inquiry for the patient. Childbirth, of course, can cause postpartum telogen effluvia, which is very common. Have they had recent surgeries? It's not only the surgery, the blood loss from the surgery, the medications from the surgery, the general anesthetic from the surgery. All of these things can trigger a telogen effluvium. So it's important to go over that as well. Next, psychosocial stressors. We hate blaming stress on hair loss. It, it means you really don't know the cause. We always stress. We just hate it. But I think there are certain stressors that have a high emotional quotient that can cause hair loss, that can disrupt the antigen, telogen uh, hair cycle. I call them the three Bs. Uh, one is bereavement. If someone has died in the family, I really think that can cause a telogen effluvium, a breakup or divorce, and in New York, a bankruptcy. I think that those kinds of things can initiate a telogen effluvium. Then medications. What, what, what have they been on within the past three to month, one to three months prior to hair loss? Uh, this is from the New England Journal article, and you can see that certain medications have a high chance of causing hair loss, a much higher chance. Lithium is notorious, 13% chance of causing hair loss through hypothyroidism or direct action on the fo follicle. We're all aware of Accutane. Uh, interferon alpha used for multiple sclerosis as well as hepatitis C. That can cause hair loss in a large number of individuals. Blood thinners, such as heparin, warfarin, can do it. While proic acid can cause telogen effluvium, terbinafine, ramipril can chelate, can chelate out zinc and cause hair loss as well. So there are certain medications that have a high chance of hair loss, others that have lower chances of hair loss. And there's telogen effluvium, which occurs two to three months after the initiation of the trigger. And of course, there's antigen effluvium that only occurs one week after the initiation of the trigger. These are more chemotherapeutic agents, and you can lose uh, almost all your ha uh, hair in these instances. Next in the history, you need to find out if there is an antigen excess. So you need to find out if they have seborrheic dermatitis, whether there's acne, whether there's hirsutism, whether there are regular menstrual cycles. Uh, you, you, need to, you need to find out where they have signs of polycystic ovary disease, which can cause androgenetic hair loss. We just, were, we just had a lecture on the importance of thyroid, and definitely signs of hypo and hyperthyroidism have to be investigated in your, uh, in your evaluation of the patient. Heavy menstruation is important. If you menstruate heavily, you'll lose a lot of blood, Let's, uh, and, um, and your, um, your, your iron will be low. So it's important to find out about what's going on with their menstrual cycle, how frequent it is, and how heavy are the periods. Next is the, the, whether they're on a vegetarian diet. What do they eat? I ask every patient. How tall are they and how much do they weigh? I get a BMI on everybody now. I need to know if they've changed at all in their BMI. Have they lost a lot of weight? Do they have an eating disorder? Many, there are quite a few people who you'd never suspect have some kind of eating disorder. And it's important for us to, to understand and pick up this on history. 
Also, what I ask is, what do you typically have for breakfast? What do you typically have for lunch? And what do you typically have for supper? And I go through the three meals, and I try to calculate whether the caloric intake is adequate and whether the protein in, in, intake is adequate. Because if it's not, they're not going to grow proper hair, even with the best treatment that you're giving them. So you have to make sure nutrition is optimized in these individuals. Okay, let's leave history and now go to the uh, clinical examination. Again, look at the distribution of the hair loss. It is, is it global? Is it localized? In this patient, it was on the sides of the scalp, top of the scalp, but the back of the scalp was spared. This is a very typical case of female pattern hair loss. Ludwig's classification is very nice, but I think there are a lot of women who don't fit Ludwig's classification. You do see a lot of women with hair loss on the sides as well. Look for inflammation, scale, and erythema. You need to find out how much, uh, you know, how much inflammation there is. This is a case of lichen planopilaris. This is a case of lupus erythematosus. So always look for this kind of thing and try to quantify it every single time they come in and take pictures. Pictures are crucial or pivotal in, in monitoring your patients. Then look for scarring versus non-scarring. Look for your follicular ostea. The top photograph is uh, alopecia areata, where ostea are very prominent. And the bottom photograph is not a scarring, uh, which is like a plantar pilaris or folliculitis de Calvins or whatever. So always look for the holes. If you can't see the holes, you're not sure, uh, then you can take out your trichoscope. Uh, your, uh, your dermatoscope or use your foliscope to figure out whether there are holes or not. Uh, here's an example of extensive lichen planum pilaris. This patient came to me at this stage. There's only so much you can do for someone like this. The aim would be to, to not regrow hair. The hair's finished, it's gone, it's kaput, but try to keep what they have so that their hair piece can still attach onto the remaining hairs that they have. This is a, uh, with a dermatoscope where you can see, look for uh, Inflammation, look for uh, ostea. So it's important many times to take out your dermatoscope or foliscope to determine what's going on. Next, look at the quality of the hair shaft itself, and that's so easy to do. You just take do the card test. You just take a white piece of paper, put it against a part, put the hairs against it, and you look for signs of regrowth. You can tell whether patient has one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters of regrowth, and you can show the patient with a mirror, you've got regrowth, sprouts are growing. It is so reassuring to the patient to hear that. They want to hear those words. Pull tests, we all know that as residents, uh, grasping hairs, making sure they did not shampoo the day that they came in, of course, and then grasping at their hairs and grasping around 60 hairs and pulling at it and seeing how much hair comes out. And this will give you an idea of how active uh, the shedding process is. What laboratory tests do I do? I do a TSH, ferritin, uh, on many of the, with these women, um, androgen levels in women if it's indicated only. Um, zinc and vitamin D is controversial. Many women want these tests, so I do it. Uh, there is no evidence-based medicine that any of this really helps, but I think that uh, patients expect it, so we do it. And of course, the scalp biopsy will also do if the diagnosis is in question. I'm doing less and less scalp, scalp biopsies now. Uh, 15 years ago, we used to do scalp biopsies on everybody, and now I hardly do them. We may only do one a day now because I use a lot of dermoscopy or trichoscopy. I can magnify the scalp 100 fold with a foliscope and I can see the classic signs that I don't need to biopsy everybody who comes in with androgenetic hair loss or telogen or fluvium, especially non scarring hair loss. I really don't need to biopsy that many people. If scarring alopecia is a different story, and even then, sometimes I'm so sure I've seen so many cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia, I don't think I have to biopsy every single one anymore. It's like 
it's, it's like psoriasis to, a, a, to, a, to, a, to us as dermatologists. Do we biopsy every case of psoriasis? No. We're so familiar with it. We see so much of it. I see three to five cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia every day. I don't think I really need to biopsy every single case. But when we do biopsy, we take a four millimeter punch, and um, if it's scarring, we, we may take two biopsies, one for vertical sectioning, one for horizontal sectioning, and we might take half of one for direct immunofluorescence to rule out lupus. Other diagnostic tools, dermoscopy, we're using more and more of that, and now video dermoscopy. I use a lot of the Korean device that we had that's here in the exhibit hall, the foloscope. I, I, I find that very useful. I don't have time to use it in the Vancouver office because we only have like 10 minutes to see a patient. But when, but when a New York patient comes in and we have an hour with a patient, we can take the device out. The patients love it. They, they are dying to go over to that machine. So they walk in, they want to know their hair counts per square centimeter. They want to know how wide their hairs are. They want to see if they're better. They love the, that kind of examination. The patients want to see numbers. So we have a pod here of a hair pod. We have the Canfield device that takes the pictures, three different views. So we have the global photographs, which aren't that accurate, really. Uh, the best thing, really, is the foloscope, I think in terms of uh, deciding whether the patient is getting better or not. The foloscope is the white device uh, on this table. And what we do is we put it on the scalp, we part the hair, and then we can, um, we can do hair shaft diameters, get an average, find out how many microns. You know, many of these cases of androgenetic hair loss, the uh, average hair shaft diameter is only uh, like 45, so it's intermediate hair. So as they improve, as they start using their treatments, usually you can see the hairs thicken up. And this is a, a typical case of androgenetic hair loss, showing the thinning hairs that mark differences in um, hair shaft diameters. So how do I treat female pattern hair loss? Uh, we're all familiar with the Ludwig classification, so I, I classify according to severity of the disorder. Uh, this would be a stage one, this would be a stage two, this would be a stage two in a 22-year-old. We also see this um, Christmas tree pattern, first described by Elise Olson. We see a lot of it. These are great hair transplant candidates because as you go posteriorly, their hair density increases so greatly. So they have wonderful, like we call it the filet mignon, of, it's just dying to be cut out and moved and, 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 and be put in the right place. Okay, uh, for uh, for transplantation because you just need to dense pack in that area and it can make a huge difference to this woman. These are, this is not before and after; it's just examples of frontal of, of just frontal accentuation or Christmas tree pattern. So what we do is look for signs and symptoms of androgen excess, and what we do is we uh, uh, we look at the Ludwig stage. Um, if there are no signs of uh, androgen excess look at the Ludwig stage. If there is, we'll do an endocrine workup, which consists of a free and total testosterone. I'll also do a DHEAS, and in Ashkenazi women, I'll do a 17-hydroxy progesterone uh, as well to determine whether there is an androgen excess. If there is, we'll get in an endocrinologist or a gynecologist who has an endocrine slant, and then we'll try to get them in on the case and help us with the case in terms of treatment. So if they are a very, uh, st if they're a stage three, uh, there's not much to do except get a good hair piece. They have bad donor areas that, uh, you know, unless you just want to keep the hair that you have, you can use minoxidil, but you're, it really, there's not much you can do for someone with this kind of hair loss. For someone who's um, stage one, two, we use topical 5% uh, uh, either solution or foam. The 5% foam now is approved for women in the USA. It was approved approximately two weeks ago, um, two or three weeks ago in the United States. Finally, the 5% foam is approved for women. And they can use it just once daily. They don't have to use it twice daily. Many women hate that morning application. It makes their hair look flat and greasy. So they'll just use it at night. 
and, um, and you can grow quite a bit of hair with topical minoxidil solution. Um, this is, many women like the solution as well. The solution is a little more precise. You can tell them to make five parts, five drops per, top, per part. The foam is a little more messy in that a lot of it ends up on the hair and not on the scalp. But then it's more, it's more localized where you're putting it so it doesn't drip. So there's advantages to both. The patient, I think they're equal in efficacy. The patient can try both and decide which one to use. Here's before and after, after just around four to five months of topical minoxidil solution. There's no question that it works in around 63% of women in terms of keeping what they have and also regrowing a little bit of hair. Here again, this is from the New England Journal article of before and after. I mean, the result isn't dramatic, but it's better than it was at baseline. So we decide whether there's improvement or not. If there is no improvement, we consider anti-antigen therapy. And if they are of uh, childbearing age, uh, consider birth control pill. In terms of anti-androgens, we use aldactone in the United States. Uh, a lot of aldactone is used. We don't have cyprogrone acetate there. We'll start out 50 milligrams twice a day. We'll do that for three months, and then we will increase to 100 milligrams twice a day. Patients need to have their potassium level checked every three months, but not only potassium, sodium as well. You can have dilutional hyponatremia. Your patient may faint and fall on their heads. We've heard of cases such as this, so you have to be careful that the electrolytes are checked every three months. Older women need their B1 and creatinins checked every three months as well. If you're putting someone over 50 on spironolactone, you need to check their renal function. Uh, that is crucial, so that's very important as well. I also do liver function tests at the CBC and DIF every three months with spironolactone. Andropure is something we also use. I don't think it works better than spironolactone, but it is something we use in Canada as well as the rest of the world. We don't have it in the USA. I do use a lot of finasteride as well. I don't use one milligram per day. That was shown not to work in a study done by Price several uh, years ago, but we use 2.5 milligrams per day, and I think that there is data out there that shows it does work. In my own clinical experience, when I do foloscope exams, I do think that it does help. We'll go to 2.5 to 5 milligrams a day, so we'll take the 5 milligram tablet and cut it in half and have them take that. I also use a lot of that in um, frontal fibrosing alopecia, or you may also use av avatars as well in frontal fibrosing alopecia. Now, if they're of childbearing age, you need to put them on the birth control pill. Spironolactone is a class D medication. Uh, finasteride is a class X medication for pregnant women. So I divide uh, my oral contraceptives into those that are excellent, very good, good or bad. The excellent ones have the non-estrogen component as an antiandrogen, such as drospirinone or cyprogrone acetate, so it's going to be Diane 35 or Yasmin. The very good ones are these that contain nergestimate, desergesterol, or norethindrone acetate, and they're here. Marvalon is fine. I wouldn't change pills. Once you start changing the birth control pill, you shock the endocrine environment around a hair follicle, you elicit a telogen effluvium, so if you're flip-flopping, you can actually make a patient worse and accelerate and unmask uh, androgenetic alopecia even more. Uh, now, levonorgestrel is fine. I don't have a problem with levonorgestrel. Uh, the bad ones, though, are norgestrel or norethindrone. These have quite androgenic activity, so these, I will take them off of these and uh, put them on something else, because I think this can make female pattern hair loss worse. So if the patient is still not satisfied, consider hair transplantation if the donor area is dense, consider a hair prosthesis, or any of these hair cosmetics, these microfibrils that you can put on the scalp. Very popular one in North America is Topic, T-O-P-P-I-K. Another one is Bumble and Bumble, which is also very popular. And interestingly enough, um, on the Home Shopping Network, one of my favorite ones in the United States is to the Joan Rivers product. Um, uh, she has a company that, um, that actually produces a product that stays on really well. So the, these are things, these are just cosmetic things that they can use. You should find out also who in your city has the best wigs. Uh, you should do your own scouting. Who has the best um, cranial prostheses? Um, and they vary in price. You can go to Macy's and get one for $200 or you can get one for $2,000, which is the average price in most places, or at Madison Avenue, New 
Or you can spend eight to ten thousand dollars. This is more for celebrities, and and it, it looks flawless when you get when you're paying that kind of money. So it depends on the low end versus high end, but you should become familiar with who has the best wigs in town, and also who are the best stylists in that store. Who who are the best people who can style the hair and integrate it well with the hair that they have. Hair transplants. Uh, we discussed this in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. They never talked about it. This was the first article ever talked about hair transplants. New England Journal of Medicine, they thought oh, this was so frivolous for them in the past. They now understand this is an important modality of therapy, and it is used more and more in women. I don't use follicular unit extractions in women. I don't think they need it. The hair is long, uh, so all you need is the strip technique. You take around 1,500 uh, follicular units, you make your holes either with needles or tiny little spears, and uh, then put them right into these tiny slits that you make. Here is before and after with 1,500 grafts. Here is before and after. This is uh, where we lowered their hairline. She thought it was too, um, too masculine, her hairline. So we lowered it and made it more feminine. I'll just briefly talk about trichotillomania because there is something fairly new, although it's not that new anymore. We're all familiar with trichotillomania and the irregular shape that it takes. Here's a mother-daughter duo at it at the same time. They weren't pulling at each other's hair, they were pulling at their own hair. And uh, what, what, uh, what can work in some of these women, um, or anyone who has trichotillomania, is anacetylcysteine. This is in the archives of psychiatry. Uh, it's good for um, obsessive compulsive disorders. We've had some cases where it did help. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. But it's something that, it's not like clomipramine that has been used. It has lots of side effects. This is something you can get from a health food store. It is cheap. It's easy first-line therapy. You might as well try it and see if it helps. I thank you for allowing me to give you this brief discussion on uh, hair loss in women. There are many other diseases, but we only have this amount of time. I thank you very much, and I thank the organizers for allowing me to, uh, to speak, and I welcome you all to Vancouver for the World Congress of Dermatology. Not hair, just this is dermatology in 2015. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe, for your wonderful and very informative presentation. Now, this paper is open for discussion. Any questions or comments? If not, because we are running out of running band schedule now, I'd like to close this session. Thank you very much.